Stephen Yervish, Manny Alvarez, and Sasha Pernick on behalf of Miguel Ruiz Lobo, who is present before the court. And your honor, interpreter is present. Jacqueline Goulder, for the record, good morning to you and your staff. Very well, thank you. I think you had a Yes. Ms. Almaswear from the interpreter Spanish to English, to answer questions, ask answers, give me a little bit to do so. I do. Jacqueline Goldridge, G U L D R I S. Ms.
up to you if you want one. I want one. Need one? Need one? Need one? Need one? Vanessa Pino, I'm currently a code compliance inspector. I work for City of Miami in the Code Compliance Department. How long have you done that kind of work? Almost eight years now. What is it that you do as a Code Compliance Officer? I do inspections for construction. I cite people for violations at their homes or their businesses. I sign for when you open a business to get your licenses and other things like that. Before doing that kind of work, what did you do? I was a crime scene investigator. How long were you a crime scene investigator? About eight years as well. And for uh, what also. department? City of Miami. Okay. What year did you, <coughs> did you start and when did you leave? I started in August of 2007 and I left in 
I believe, May of 2015. Okay. Um, I want to call your attention back to the day of June 22nd, 2014, going into the early morning hours of June 23rd, 2014. Were you working as a crime scene investigator that evening? Yes. Can you tell the jurors, what was the shift that you were assigned? I was on C-shift, so I worked 11 p.m. to 7 in the morning. Midnights? Yes. Um, how long did you work midnights? Almost all of my eight years there. So how do you like living now in the daylight world again? Oh, I feel like a zombie sometimes. <laughs> um, now let's look into um, a particular case number, and that case number is going to be... Uh, City of Miami Police Department case number 1406221824495. Did you do any work under that City of Miami Police Department police case number? Yes, I did. And did you document the work you did by writing up a report and a property receipt? Yes. Now, in that particular case, did you go to the actual crime scene of 834 Northwest 4th Street in Miami, Florida? No, I did not. Did you go to the JMH Trauma Center to see the child victim? No. What did you do? I responded to the homicide office and to the, we call it FPL, the Forensic Processing Lab. Okay. And what is it that you did at the homicide office? At the homicide office, at the request of Detective Garcia, I took an oral um, DNA standard from the defendant. Uh, question for you. Um, when you work in crime scene and you have to collect evidence, let's say a, a DNA swab or um, a swab of suspected blood or scrapings of fingernails, do you have individually packaged items to use for that type of collection of evidence? Yes, we have sterile um, swabs, which are like essentially like a long-handled Q-tip. Um, they're sterile and they're sealed, and then we also wear gloves. And that's just to guard against any cross-contamination? Correct. When is it that, well, the name of the person that you collected DNA swabs, did you note it on your report? Yes. What was that name? Miguel Angel Ruiz. And did you also note that person's date of birth? Yes. What was that date of birth? Can I refer back to? Of course. I don't want to make a mistake. Uh, March 9th, 1972. Now, did you document when you collected that DNA standard? Yes. When did you collect it? At 1.25 in the morning. On what day? On uh, June 22nd, 2014. Hold on. Wait. It was after midnight, so it would have been now June 23rd, okay. 2014. And that would be a common thing for you as a C-shift uh, yes. employee, right? Because you're going from 11 p.m. over midnight into the Correct. following day? Yes. Okay. Now, the homicide office, that's on the fifth floor of the main city of Miami Police Department headquarters building? Correct. Central Station. Okay. Now, can you describe for the members of the jury, like, why do you collect the DNA standard? So basically the DNA standard is collected so that for, it could be for elimination purposes or for purposes like today. So you have something to compare to any other evidence that's collected and so you can know if there's a match to this specific person or not. Can you walk us through the, well, let me ask you, over your career as a crime scene investigator, do you know about how many DNA standards you collected from people? I would say hundreds, possibly. Okay. Um, can you walk us through the process by which you collect a DNA standard? So we put gloves on. Um, we open the sterile Q-tip um, envelope. And then you ask the person to open their mouth. And you put the Q-tips in their mouth. And you kind of, um, like, in a circular motion, just rub on the inside of their mouth um, and their gums to collect saliva. And then what do you do with that swab once you've finished that process? Uh, put it back in the envelope, um, and then I would have um, documented uh, who it was from, the case number, um, the date, the person, oh, I already said that, who it was from, um, and then later on um, submit it to the property unit. Now, this particular swab that you collected in the early morning hours of June 20, 
3rd, 2014. Do you have an independent recollection today of what the person looks like that you collected that DNA from? No. Now let's suppose that witnesses have identified the defendant, for the record I'm indicating the defendant seated between Mr. Yermish and Mr. Alvarez, that they have identified him as Miguel Ruiz, and that his attorneys have stipulated in court that's who he is, and that the police case number for which he has been charged in this case is 140622, dash 182495. Under that set of circumstances, would you feel confident that the DNA swab you collected was in fact from this defendant? Yes. <coughs> Ms. Pino, I'm going to show you an exhibit. It states Exhibit 6Y for identification. I want to ask if you recognize any of the writing on that exhibit. This one. Here, I don't. You can open it. It's been resealed, so let me open it. shorthanded signature and then also my employee identification number is on there on top of the red tape which is used to seal the envelope. Can you take a look and open that package now? swabs and it has writing on it it's my handwriting it has my initials the time that it was collected um, the case number the address of the original um, crime scene and then what it is so it says oral standard from Miguel Angel Ruiz DOB 3972 is this in fact the DNA standard then that you collected from the defendant in this case yes Judge, at this time, I move State's Exhibit uh, 6Y for identification and evidence. No objection. No in this little sleeve, if you will, are the sticks. What happens to the Q-tip part or the, the cotton swab part? So they get sent to the lab and then the lab technician uses those tips to retrieve the DNA from the swabs. Thank you. 
Mark Perry, you can save some twenty bucks. It's one hundred and twenty five. Do you recognize what this exhibit is? Yes. Is that in fact the property receipt that was prepared when you turned that DNA standard over to the property bureau? Yes. Does it indicate what date and what time you turned over that DNA standard that we just saw to the property bureau? Yes. When? Uh, June 23rd at 2.31 a.m. Okay. And when you turned it over to the property bureau, was it sealed in the, with the red tape that you showed us? Yes. And you had put your initials, your badge number, as well as the case number? Not the case number, just the, um, my identification number, or we call it IBM, and my shorthand signature. When you're actually checking it in to the property bureau, though, do you have to give them the particular case yes. number? Yes. Okay. Um, after you, um, also, when you finished collecting the DNA standard from the defendant, did you also collect what are known as elimination fingerprints? Yes. What is that? So it's, um, it's a card to collect all of, to, we call it rolling the fingerprints. Um, we did that in the forensic processing lab, also at the station, um, and it's basically a table that's set up with an ink pad and a roller to put the ink on the person's hands and then roll each finger. And I think also the palms. Did you do any other work in this case? Other than the fingerprints and the DNA? No. Okay, no other questions. No questions for this witness, Your Honor. Thank you.
Yeah. 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 Frozen for over yeah. seven days. 
But back then, 25 years ago, I didn't even realize it. So when I got the fresh tuna, we would mess this whole thing. So, you know, that didn't work out too well. But now I go like you can go with wild pork. All their fish is flat cooked. You can't get no better than that. So you can eat any of their fish. City of Miami Police Department. Yes, ma'am. For the record, I'm show, showing Council States 7T, 7S, and 7R. Officer Palacios, you told us a couple of days ago that when you responded to this scene at 834 Northwest 4th Street, 
there was a child that was being held by her mother. You remember telling us that? Yes, ma'am. And that you tried your best to do CPR, to do chest compressions. Fire rescue takes her body away. Um, you had some blood nearby you as you did that, correct? There was a, a little blood on the carpet, yes. Okay. And in the course of your activities that day, did you actually step in that pool of the child's blood? Yes, ma'am. And did that wind up leaving a, a, a shoe print actually on the floor? Yes, ma'am. Now, you told us that when you had finished your work, um, you know, directing who was to do what, you had a debriefing with the homicide investigators that came. Yes, I did. And to tell them about what you had seen and what you had done leading up to that moment. Is that fair to say? That is fair to say, yes. Did you tell them that you believed that that bloody footprint was in fact from your shoes? Objection leading. Sustained. What did you tell them? During the debriefing, part of the debriefing that I, you know, that I gave them, besides the, you know, the part of the CPR and all that, I told them that I stepped on the on the blood and that I let the, uh, a bloody shoe uh, shoe print on the floor that it was mine. Why would you bother to tell them that information? Because that would be part of the crime scene, so that they know it's it's mine. Since I was there, you know, I, I probably disturbed some some of the crime scene, so I need to make sure that they know that that's mine rather than thinking that they need to take measurements, um, look for who let, who maybe left that footprint behind? Yes, ma'am. So they could concentrate on the actual investigation? Objection, Your Honor, leaving. Oh, okay. so was, what was your intention in giving them that information? So that when the crime scene unit processed this, the crime scene, that they knew that that was, that was part of, of of what I was doing, that is something that I left. That's like, for example, like if we respond to other scenes, uh, to give an example, like burglary, and I open the door, you see my hands. When they come back, uh, you know, when, when crime scene comes, I will tell them, hey, my prints are gonna be on that, on that door now, so that they can discard that and concentrate on, on, on what they have to do. Nothing further. No questions. I'm passing forward the stipulation. Dr. Nicholas Namayas. In AN 
IAS. Good morning, Doctor. Good morning. Would you please tell us your name? Nicholas Nemias. And it's Dr. Nemias, correct? Correct. What kind of doctor are you? I'm a, a trauma surgeon. Where do you currently work? Uh, I work for the University of Miami at Jackson Memorial Hospital, Ryder Trauma Center. How long have you worked there? Um, since 1998, and before that, uh, from 1989 to 1996 uh, as a resident at Jackson Memorial Hospital. Tell us about your educational background. Uh, I went to college at uh, Rutgers University in New Jersey, uh, graduated in 1985, medical school, Rutgers Medical School in New Jersey, graduated in 1989, uh, training in general surgery, uh, 1989 to 1994 at Jackson Memorial Hospital, fellowship in uh, trauma surgery and surgical critical care, 1994 to 1996, um, and then since we considered ourselves lifelong students, work history, um, assistant professor of surgery at Emory University, 1996 to 1998. And then uh, at, back at the University of Miami, 1998 to the present, going from uh, assistant professor of surgery to professor of surgery with tenure. And I'm currently the um, uh, executive vice chair for the Department of Surgery and the chief of the Ryder Trauma Center. Um, I'm assuming you have um, a medical license. Yes. Okay. And is that through the state of Florida? Yes. What do you have to do to um, get a medical license and then maintain a medical license? Uh, to get a medical license, you have to have a, a, a degree in medicine um, and uh, training, at least two years of residency training after medical school. Okay. And then how do you maintain that license? Uh, you maintain that license by showing that you have some continuing medical education that's required by the state. How many hours is required? I, I don't know. I exceed the hours by many fold because of my needs to remain certified in general surgery and my academic activities. So are you also board certified? Yes. Okay. And what does that mean to be board certified? Uh, I'm board certified in general surgery that qualifications in surgical critical care. It means I had to pass a, a written exam and an oral exam and uh, retook that exam uh, every 10 years and starting in Starting in the three years from now, instead of an every 10-year exam, it will be a continuous, um, medical, continuous medical education credits that are monitored by the American Board of Surgery. Okay. And uh, you said, I think, but in what areas are you board certified? Uh, general surgery and surgical critical care. There is no board certification for trauma. It's, it's part of general surgery. Are you a member of any professional organizations? Uh, yes. The relevant ones would be the uh, American College of Surgeons, the American Association for the Surgery of Trauma, the Western Trauma Association, the Eastern Association for the Surgery of Trauma, uh, and the Society of Critical Care Medicine. Okay. Um, are you a member of the Florida Committee on Trauma? Uh, yes, I'm the past chair of the Florida Committee on Trauma, and I'm a member of the uh, National American College of Surgeons Committee on Trauma. When were you the chairman of the Florida Committee on Trauma? Uh, until about two years ago for a six year span. Okay. Um, and do you still make, remain active on that committee? Yes. Um, do you teach? Yes. Where do you teach? Uh, I'm a professor of surgery at the University of Miami Motor School of Medicine, so I teach uh, medical students, residents. Um, we teach and train, so we, we train the U.S. Army in trauma care. They come uh, and they're stationed uh, in there at the Ryder Trauma Center. Uh, we also train the White House Medical Unit uh, at my center. So um, are there specific classes that you teach 
regularly? It's it's clinical. It's not in the classroom. It's it's in the hospital. Okay. And you, uh, you mentioned the U.S. Army. You mentioned the White House staff. Um, are your um, the people that you teach? Are they generally they have a medical background? Uh, yes. Okay. Um, are you published? Yes. Okay. And have you testified in court as an expert before? Uh, yes. Approximately how many times? I, I don't know exactly, but I don't do it frequently. It's on the order of. 10 or 20, it's not in the hundreds. I don't make a living or a practice out of it. Just when subpoena? Correct. Okay. Um, now, I think you said that you're currently the medical director of Jackson Memorial Hospital <coughs> Rider Trauma Center? Yes. Okay. How long have you held that position? Um, since 2010. What is Rider Trauma Center? Uh, trauma centers are uh, certified by the state and verified by the American College of Surgeons and they are places that are equipped to um, take care of uh, injured people 24 hours, 7 days a week with their availability of uh, surgeons, CAT scans, nursing staff, anesthesiologists, operating room, whatever you need for immediate care. Uh, we, are, we have been a trauma center uh, since trauma centers exist in Dade County and for many years we were the only one. Um, uh, now there are several in Dade County. Are trauma centers assigned levels? Yes, uh, Rider Trauma Center is a level one, which is the highest level by the state and by the American College of Surgeons. And who, what does that mean to be a level one trauma center? Uh, what it means is that we have all of those resources that are available as well as we do research um, in the field of trauma and surgical critical care. Um, you said that you are part of Jackson? Uh, yes, the, um, I work for the University of Miami, but we, we provide the physicians for Jackson Memorial Hospital. Okay. Um, and is Rider Trauma part of Jackson or is it part of the University of Miami? It's part of the, the physical building itself is part of Jackson, but the medical staff are from the University of Miami. Where is it located? Uh, the address is 1800 Northwest 10th Avenue. Um, it's on the Jackson campus. Is it right near where we are right now? Yes. Okay. Did you walk here in fact? Yes. Okay. Um, what kinds of cases come into Rider Trauma Center? Um, typically that's decided by uh, EMS and uh, what we get are... When you say EMS, what emergency, I'm sorry, emergency medical services, okay. so ambulances. Okay. Um, and so we get by ground uh, people who are close by and when traffic is not bad who are in bad car crashes, stabbings, gunshots, falls, burns, um, and when, when traffic is bad or if it's from far, from far away but not closer to another trauma center, they come by air as well. Okay, so they are, they're, they're helicopter? <coughs> yeah, helicopter. Okay. Um, explain what you do as the medical director. Um, as the medical director, I, I sort of oversee uh, quality um, and uh, scheduling of staff and reviewing of cases. So. I review, uh, I review every injured patient that comes through Jackson Memorial Hospital, whether they're seen at the trauma center or not, uh, for quality of care, uh, any, any bad outcomes, any complications, um, and uh, I review those and take appropriate actions to continuously improve quality. Okay. It sounds like you have a lot of administrative duties as yes. a medical director, but do you also continue to see patients? Yes, I do. Okay. Um, tell us about... Uh, you have a full caseload like the other doctors or? Yeah, we measure, I mean, one way to measure it is sort of the productivity. There's, there's a measure of, uh, they're called relative value units. It's a measure of productivity of how much a doctor does in any field and they standardize it to compare across all fields. And despite what I do administratively, I do more than the benchmark for a full-time clinical surgeon. Thank you for your time today. You're welcome. Um, now, you also said you're the chief of the Division of Trauma and Acute Care Surgery? Correct. Okay, and that's for, um, is that for Jackson as well? It's in Jackson, but it's the, that title is in the University of Miami. So acute care surgery is a recent term that encompasses everything trauma, emergency general surgery, and surgical critical care. How long have you held that position? Same time, uh, since 2010. And what are your duties as the chief of the division of trauma and acute care surgery? Well, so as the chief of the division, that's the University of Miami title, so I'm responsible for the, the physicians that are doing this, I'm their boss. So I look at their individual quality, I, I see towards their promotions and, you know, their professional development academically. 
I want to take you back to June of 2014. Um, during that time period, were you did you hold hold the same positions that yes. you hold today? Yes. Um, and you were at working at Writer Trauma Center. Yes. So I'm going to specifically draw your attention to June 22nd of 2014. Do you remember an 11 year old patient named Martha Guzman arriving at Writer Trauma Center that day? Yes. Now, I know you see a lot of cases and a lot of very um, traumatic cases. Do you actually remember this child? Yes. Why do you remember her? Um, it, it, it's remarkable when you have uh, a child patient and a child patient who's seriously injured. And um, uh, when we reviewed this case with your team, uh, I went through the chart again and it brought back the, the recollections of, of that evening. Do you know approximately what time she arrived at Ryder? Uh, I, I didn't, but since I just reviewed the chart, I believe it was 1456, so that would be like 256 in the afternoon. I think something like that, so it was actually afternoon. And she was brought by fire rescue? Uh, yes. Now when fire rescue brings a patient like this, do they give you warning? Yeah, warning? typically they do, yeah. We have, we have radio um, in the trauma center and they radio in that they're bringing. They'll, they won't be overly specific, they'll say, um, they'll give some vital signs uh, and they'll say what the mechanism of the injury was. Okay. Um, so once you get the call from fire rescue, what do you do to prepare? So once the radio call comes in, someone in the someone who's um, sitting in the trauma resuscitation area will send out an alert by the pager, and we will gather in the trauma center um, and put on our personal protective equipment. And the rooms are always ready; they're set up with all the equipment. But we gather the personnel and wait. Um, was this child brought? Was Marta Guzman brought pretty quickly? Um, I didn't review the time in the chart, uh, but I know that the address was local because I remember thinking about it and it said something like, I think, Southwest 4th Street. I don't know why I was thinking about the, the area of the, I don't know, 2014 if it was the stadium or the Orange Bowl, I guess it was the stadium. Um, but I, I remember that being the area and by ground, so yes, I think it was close by and fast. Okay. So once she gets there, what happens? Um, so. This was 10 years ago, so the, the minute by minute, I mean, what I remember is the image in my head of, you know, looking down at the young girl, and it's very hard for us because at the time, my kids, you know, I had kids older and younger than this patient, so it becomes personal. And uh, I just remember seeing this, this horrible, more than a stab wound, you know, in the left neck and in the left wrist. Um, and, um, you know, I remember that. And I, what I remember, you know, without prompting from the chart or any notes or anything like that, is that she ended up uh, dying. Uh, and on my review of the chart, um, it shows that she came in, um, there's a nursing uh, notation about uh, temperature, and it just wrote, what the nurse wrote, she didn't take a temperature, she wrote cold. Um, I saw the note from my uh, anesthesia colleagues who um, put the breathing tube in, um, and I saw my note that indicated that I immediately determined that she had suffered a full cardiac arrest, was, you know, for all intents and purposes, dead. Um, but we, we have um, techniques for some patients who have died very shortly before they arrive and who might have something surgically reversible. Um, we can open the chest um, and, and see if there's something we can correct. And my notes show that I did that. We opened her left chest. I do want to go through all that with you. Yeah. Um, so but let's back up just a little bit. Sure. So when she arrived, you, you were the attending physician? Yes. Okay. And um, what was her condition on arrival? Like I said, I, essentially dead, but we still try. Okay, so when she arrived, people checked for things like a pulse and yes, temperature and, none, and all those things. And none were present. The nurse noted that she was cold. There's documentation that the heart rate was zero, the blood pressure was zero, that she wasn't doing anything. 
Um, what injuries, you mentioned some of them, but just go in, what did, injuries did you observe? Or the, the ones that I remember uh, are the left neck, um, you know, a stab wound, typically our stab wounds are just a slit in the skin the size of the knife. This was not, this was tissue destructive. Um, and, and wrist, uh, what we documented, we wrote laceration, but as I recall, it was, uh, again, more just destructive, not just a cut. It was a cut to the bone? Uh, you know, a, a decade later and after, you know, hearing about it and reviewing it, um, it, it's hard to put that picture in my mind, but as I remember it was, yes, it was, I mean, I, I hate to use any, being careful of my descriptive language, I don't know if any family is in the room and I don't want to upset anybody too much, but it was bad. Um, now, based on the location of the injuries, um, you know, first, have you seen cases of suicide before? Yes. Okay. Um, when you, when this child came in, you know, based on the location of the injuries, did you at all think that this could have been a suicide? No. Um, and why? Why would you say that? We've seen people who attempt suicide by knife, and, and what they might have are some lacerations, maybe even deep lacerations, but they're typically, a laceration's a cut. Um, they're typically a single cut, um, but people don't destroy, create, you know, horrible wounds with knives on themselves. It's, it's kind of hard after you've made that first stab, particularly people with stabs to the chest or the neck, they'll, they'll stick themselves once and then, it, you know, I think biology kicks in and you just can't do that to yourself. Um, so suicide attempts with a knife are usually some uh, clean, single wound not over and over, or destructive. Your Honor, <coughs> with respect to these, I uh, renew our previous objection and stand on the grounds that we previously stated. Very well. Objection. Your Honor, may I approach? Yeah. Let the record reflect. I'm showing the witness what has been marked for identification as case 1D and case 1A. Do you recognize Andrew's case photos? Well, obviously only because I'm reminded of them at this time. Mm -hmm. um, but if you're telling me that this is her, then you know, this is her. Is that what you remember? Um, the if this is her hand, yes, that's what I remember from the wrist. If this is, and this is, this is her wrist, that's her hand here. So this is how I remember the wrist. And just for the record, that states on the... Yes, that's how I remember the wrist. Uh, the neck, I remember as worse than this. Um, and if this head is uh, turned, um, I wonder if I'm missing anything that's just out of sight on this picture. But I remember the neck is worse than that. Um, you are at 1A, 1D, Your Honor, I also object based upon insufficient identification and foundation.
the magnet. Would it be possible for somebody to do this to their wrist and then also stab themselves in the neck? Not in what I've seen. And, you know, I've been doing this, like I said, if you can include training since 1989, and uh, I've not seen that before. Now, when she arrived, you said she was deceased? Yes. Um, did you and your staff also check for vital signs, you said? So it's a team effort. Somebody checked for vital signs. My, my role would have been to get an overall impression looking at her, hear from rescue what they have, uh, maybe put my finger on a pulse somewhere and make a decision li literally within 15 to 30 seconds that she's not alive and I need to open the chest. Okay. Now based on her condition at the time of the revival, were you surprised that fire rescue brought her in? Uh, I wouldn't use the word surprised. Um, it, it is, and I don't remember what I might have said before I remembered earlier, but I would say that fire rescue tends to bring people in the same way that we will make all efforts at someone who might otherwise appear dead, especially with a, a child. Rescue will bring them in also, hoping maybe that we have something for them. Uh, it, it would not have been unreasonable given her condition for fire rescue to just call the police and send her to the medical examiner, but everybody tries. You want to say rescue? Yeah. So did you, at the emergency room, did you try also to save her? Yes. Okay, so when, um, what steps do you take in a situation like this? So when, when it's a young person who's um, uh, died and you think it's from blood loss, uh, one thing you can do is open the chest and instead of CPR like you see on TV or those who are trained where you do the chest compressions from the outside, we can open the chest and directly squeeze the heart and we can instill blood directly into the heart um, and we can look for um, a penetrating injury to the heart that we can maybe fix and in the there, there are injuries. We have seen people who have an injury to the neck where the weapon goes down into the chest and there's something you fix in the chest. So our, this is called an emergency department thoracotomy and that's what we proceeded with. So anesthesia, put a breathing tube in her trachea so she can breathe and I opened the chest so we could squeeze the heart and see if we could revive her. She was intubated? That's, that's what anesthesia did, yes. Okay, that's that, that's that breathing tube you just yes. spoke of? Um, so let's go back a little bit. When she's intubated, what does that mean that she's intubated? So that's something we do for people who either can't breathe or can't protect their airway from just aspirating or inhaling their own saliva or vomit. Uh, so you put the tube in so that you can provide, uh, you can squeeze a bag or hook up a ventilator and provide air okay. to the patient. And um, is it possible during that process of putting that, um, the tube in, is it possible to knock a tooth out? Does that happen? Yes. In fact, I reviewed the chart last night, and the anesthesia note makes note that they did, in fact, knock out a tooth. Um, and that's just something that happens? It happens. So let's go back to the surgery you performed. Um, when you performed the surgery, did you observe whether she had lost a lot of blood? Uh, well, yes, because the, um, uh, I, I believe I noted in the chart that the heart felt empty. And you, with experience, you get a feel for how full the heart is just from the feel of it. 
and it was it was empty. And um, uh, we actually had started some transfusion. So yeah, my impression was that my impression at the time was that she had bled to death prior to arriving. Um, and are you the doctor who pronounced her deceased? Yes. Um, what time did you make that official pronouncement? I don't remember. It was that. It would have been around that time. Same time. Within minutes of that time. I think, I think it might have been 15, 20, but. So in a situation involving a death investigation such as this one, um, are there usually officers, uh, police officers, presence? Yeah, very commonly. They, they follow. They follow. Either they arrive with the patient or very shortly thereafter. Are they allowed in the exam room? They, they don't come in the exam room. They're, they're, very, they, they're typically outside of the exam room in the hallway, and they're very respectful to ask when they can come into the exam room. Are you typically in communication with the law enforcement officers? When I'm, when I'm done doing what I have to do with the patient, I'll step outside, and if they have questions, I don't approach them for, to give them information, but if, they, if they're waiting for me to ask me questions, I answer the questions. Um, so once you've done everything you can do, is the victim's body transported to the medical examiner's office? Yes. Um, and just, are you familiar with how that takes place just very generally? Uh, generally, we have, a, we have a room there on the first floor where the, the body is kept until the medical examiner comes. And they, I've seen the van of the medical examiner outside the building. And, they send personnel to take the body to the medical examiner's office. Where is the medical examiner's office in relation to your office? Across the street on 10th Avenue. Okay. <coughs> Nothing further. No questions.
me ask you, you can all be seated, let me ask you, I have two emails from the juror, which is one in this uh, vacant part of the record. Yeah, I think you could put them together and just make it whatever, court one, court whatever we're up to. Well, what it is, is this one email at 5.58 a.m., the next one at 6.26 a.m., which includes the information from the 5.28 a.m., but I'll just include them both together uh, as, as a court exhibit. And I guess for completion purposes, our vote now, you know, strike him for cause. Well, well, I don't think it's cause at this point. Well, I, I, I don't mean that he can't be fair, but just that he's, he's just he's just excused. He's excused because of illness, yeah. and then we go to an alt we go to the alt first alternate. That's all. He's an alternate. Oh, he's an alternate. Yeah. Yeah. He's an alternate. It's fine. Okay, so we'll be excusing him. Um, I believe he was procedure to gentleman with the second alternate. Yeah. Yes. In large measure, that was done to make sure that I did not accidentally elicit 
you know, information that had been the subject of our sidebar no. conversation. I, so I, I, I didn't mean to be no, leaning no. in any way other than just to make sure that we didn't open any doors that didn't need to be opened. I, I didn't object to the no, questions in that area. That we got a little beyond it, and that's where I started objecting. I understand what the state was doing. I didn't have an issue with it. I was perfectly fine with it and understood also why you questioned the way you did it. Okay, very good. Thank you. Have a good one.